Good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer for Wednesday, August 12th. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The king in his might loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Our New Testament reading tonight is from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. When one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more, then, matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers, but brother goes to law against brother and that before unbelievers? To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be enslaved by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord, and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with them. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. And our Book of Concord reading tonight is the first part of Article 2 on Original Sin. Uh, first two paragraphs, these are some uh, editor's notes in the reader's edition. Article 2, Original Sin. Note. By the 16th century, Roman theologians had come to view original sin merely as a weakness in human nature. 
The scriptures, however, teach that original sin is the absence of original righteousness and the root cause of all sinful thoughts, words, and deeds. Original sin damns a person to hell, the Bible asserts, so clear definitions were needed. Rome sought some way to preserve mankind's ability to choose God's grace and cooperate with it. So it regarded concupiscence, the powerfully strong tendency in us to sin, not as sin, but as mere tinder, which could ignite into sinful behavior. The Bible, as the Lutherans were concerned to prove, also names as sin our inborn tendency to sin. Article 2 of the Apology is essential for understanding what follows in Articles 3 and 4. Melanchthon points out the key comforting truth of God's word. In Christ, God removes the condemnation of all sin, including concupiscence. He does so by forgiving us our sins through Christ's blood and by applying to us Christ's righteousness, holiness, and innocence. So while in this life sin remains, the Holy Spirit continually brings it under check, beats it down, and kills it, and works within us to increase and strengthen our faith in God and love for our neighbor. Article 2, Original Sin The adversaries approve Article 2, Original Sin, but in such a way that they actually condemn our definition of original sin, which we gave in passing. Here, right at the outset, Your Majesty, will discover that the Confutation's writers were lacking not only judgment, but also honesty. We simply wanted to mention the things that original sin includes, but these men, by creating a misleading interpretation, cleverly twist a statement that in itself contains nothing wrong. So they say to lack fear of God and to lack faith is actual guilt. Therefore, they deny it is original sin. Clearly, these sorts of subtleties start in the schools, not in the emperor's council. Even though such sophistry can be easily refuted, we ask that the Augsburg Confession in German be examined, so that all good people will understand that we do not teach anything absurd in this manner. This will free us from the suspicion of teaching something new, for there it is written. It is further taught that since Adam's fall, all human beings who are naturally conceived are born in sin. From their mother's womb, they are all filled with evil desire and the inclination toward evil. By nature, they have no true fear of God and no true faith in God. As this passage demonstrates, we teach that those who are born according to the fleshly nature have concupiscence. This means people not only lack fear and trust in God, but also do not even have the power or gifts to produce fear and trust in God. What fault can be found with this point? Indeed, we think that we have explained and defended ourselves well enough to good men. For in this sense, the Latin description denies to nature the ability, gifts, and energy to produce fear and trust in God. In adults, we deny the ability actually to do anything truly good. So when we mention concupiscence, we understand not only the acts or fruit, but also the constant inclination of the nature. Now we will show more fully that our description agrees with the usual and ancient definition. First, we must show why we prefer to use these words in this place. In their schools, the adversaries confess that the material, as they call it, of original sin is concupiscence. We should not have passed by this fact in framing our definition precisely because some are offering philosophical speculations in a way that is not appropriate for teachers of religion. Some of them claim that original sin is not a depravity or corruption in human nature, but only servitude or a condition of morality. They say that it is not inherent in our nature, but is rather a burden, put on us as a result of Adam's sin, not that we have any such depravity of our own. Besides, they add that no one is condemned to eternal death on account of original sin, just as the child born of a slave woman becomes a slave not as a result of any personal fault, but as a result of his mother's condition. To show that this impious opinion is displeasing to us, we use the word concupiscence. With the best intention, we have explained this term as diseases, and said that the nature of human beings is born corrupt and full of wrath. We have not only used the word concupiscence, but we have also said that the fear of God and faith are lacking. We added this comment because the scholastic teachers do not understand the de definition of original sin well enough. They take what they received from the fathers and extend the definition of original sin. They argue that the evil inclination is a quality like a blemish on the body. With their usual folly, they ask whether this quality is caused from the contagiousness of the apple or from the breath of the serpent, 
and whether medicines can cure the condition. They suppress the main point with such questions. So when they talk about original sin, they do not mention the more serious faults of human nature, such as ignorance of God, contempt for God, total lack and fear of God, and confidence in God, hatred of God's judgment, fleeing from God when he judges us, anger toward God, despairing of God's grace, putting trust in things of this world, and so forth. The scholastics do not notice all these diseases that are totally contrary to God's law. They even say that human nature is entirely capable of loving God above all things and fulfilling God's commandments, according to the substance of the act. These diseases are totally contrary to God's law, but the scholastics do not notice them. They do not even realize that they are contradicting themselves. For what else is being able, by one's own strength, to love God above all things and fulfill his commandments, except original righteousness? If human nature is so strong that it is able on its own to love God above all things, as the scholastics confidently affirm, what then is original sin? Why do we need Christ's grace, if we could be justified as a result of our own righteousness? Why do we need the Holy Spirit if we are strong enough on our own to love God above all things and fulfill God's commandments? Is there anyone who does not realize that our adversaries' ideas are absurd? They recognize the less serious diseases in human nature, but the more serious they do not even acknowledge. Scripture everywhere warns us, as the prophets constantly complain about putting our confidence in our human abilities, contempt for God, hating God, and similar faults with which we are born. See Psalm 13, Psalm 14, 1-3, 140, verse 3, and 36, verse 1. After the scholastics mixed philosophical speculations about the perfection of nature, the light of reason, with Christian doctrine, they credited more than was possible to the ability of free will. They taught that people are justified before God by philosophical or civic righteousness. We, too, confess that such things are subject to reason, and so to some degree are within our power. However, as a result of their speculations, they could not see the inner uncleanness of human nature. This can only be evaluated and understood on the basis of God's word, which the scholastics do not use very often in their discussions. These were the reasons why we also mentioned concupiscence in our description of original sin and why we deny to human nature the ability to fear and trust in God. We wanted to show that original sin contains these diseases, ignorance of God, contempt for God, not having fear and trust in God, the inability to love God. These are the chief faults of human nature because they conflict with the first table of the Ten Commandments. See Exodus 23-11. We have not said anything new. The ancient definition of original sin, understood correctly, says precisely the same thing. Original sin is the absence of original righteousness. But what is righteousness? Here the scholastics wrangle over philosophical questions. They do not explain what original righteousness is. In the scriptures, righteousness consists not only in obeying the second table of the Ten Commandments, which are about good works and serving our fellow man, but also the first table, which teaches about fearing God, faith, and loving God. Therefore, original righteousness includes not only physical health in all ways, as they contend, but also these gifts, a sure and certain knowledge of God, fear of God, confidence in God, and the desire and ability to give God these things. Scripture testifies to this when it says in Genesis 1.27 that man was made in the image and likeness of God. What else was this image and likeness other than that man was created with wisdom and righteousness so that he could apprehend God and reflect God? Mankind was given the gift of knowing God, fearing God, and being confident in God. This is how Irenaeus and Ambrose interpret the likeness to God. Ambrose not only says many things to this effect, but especially declares, That soul is not, therefore, in the image of God, in which God is not dwelling at all times. Paul shows in Ephesians 5.9 and Colossians 3.10 that the image of God is the knowledge of God, righteousness, and truth. Lombard is not afraid to say that original righteousness is the very likeness to God which God implanted in man. We recount the opinions of the ancients which in no way interfere with Augustine's interpretation of the image. The ancient definition of original sin is that it is a lack of righteousness. 
This definition not only denies that mankind is capable of obedience in his body, but also denies that mankind is capable of knowing God, placing confidence in God, fearing and loving God, and certainly also the ability to produce such things. For even the theologians themselves teach in their schools that these are not produced without certain gifts in the aid of grace. In order that the matter may be understood, we say that these gifts are precisely the knowledge of God and fear and confidence in God. From these facts, it appears that the ancient definition says precisely the same thing that we say, denying fear and confidence toward God. It denies not only the actions, but also the gifts and ability to produce these acts. Of original importance is the definition of original sin found in the writings of Augustine. He is used to defining original sin as concupiscence, wicked desire. He means that when righteousness has been lost, concupiscence came in its place. Since diseased nature cannot fear and love God and believe God, it seeks and loves carnal things. By nature, when we are secure, we hold God's judgment in contempt. When we are terrified, we hate God's judgment. This is why Augustine includes both the defect and the vicious habit that have come in its place in his definition of original sin. Concupiscence is not only a corruption of physical qualities, but also in the higher powers a vicious turning to fleshly things. These people do not realize the contradiction in what they are saying. At the same time, they attribute to mankind a concupiscence that is not entirely destroyed by the Holy Spirit, and also the ability to love God above all things. And we will read the second half of Article 2 tomorrow evening. Join together in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. God the Father in heaven, have mercy. God the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy. God the Holy Spirit, have mercy. Be gracious to us, spare all the dying. From all sin, from all evil, from the devil's might, from the devil's wiles, from your wrath and from hell's torment, from sudden and evil death, good Lord, deliver them. By the mystery of your holy incarnation, by your holy nativity, by your agony and bloody sweat, by your cross and passion, by your precious death and burial, by your glorious resurrection and ascension, and by the grace of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. Help them, good Lord. In the hour of death, on the day of judgment, help them, good Lord. We poor sinners implore you to hear us, good Lord, to comfort all the dying, to forgive them all their sins, to lead them out of this misery into eternal life. We implore you to hear us, good Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, we implore you to hear us. Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, grant us your peace. O Christ, hear us. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. Amen. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day, and I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong 
and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.